What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. All right, so for this case, we've got a 36-year-old man. And he's brought to the emergency department after being a restrained passenger, meaning he had his seatbelt on, in a high-speed motor vehicle accident. So even though he had his seatbelt on, which protects him, he was in a very high-speed motor vehicle accident. So he's still at risk for some significant blunt trauma, otherwise young, healthy guy. So in the, DD, in the ED, the patient complains of severe back pain and generalized abdominal pain. So severe back pain could be a number of things. You know, he could have a vertebral fracture, some type of spine fracture. Um, he also could have, you know, a hemorrhage somewhere. He could have an internal organ injury, you know, liver injury, spleen injury, kidney injury, uh, generalized abdominal pain, same, same thing. You know, he could have a bowel perforation. He could have a bleed, uh, some other type of organ injury. We just don't know yet. It's just not enough yet. Any trauma patient, you always want to look at the vitals. So his vitals are 37 degrees Celsius. So he's afebrile. His heart rate is 124. So he's definitely tachycardic. His blood pressure is 74 over 43. This is not good. This is pretty low. Um, definitely want to be doing something about this immediately. His heart rate is likely a tachycardic response to hypotension. Respiration rate is 24. So he's breathing pretty fast, but that's probably because he's, you know, basically in, in some type of shock here and hypotension. Uh, and then his O2 stat is still pretty good. It's 98%. So he's not, you know, having any kind of respiratory, you know, difficulties yet, but his blood pressure is something we definitely got to be concerned for. Physical exam is notable for generalized abdominal tenderness. So again, not too surprising here. His labs are notable for a hemoglobin of five. As you can see in a normal adult male, it's 13.5 to 17.5. So this is very low. So he is definitely anemic which would translate into, given that his blood pressure is so low and his heart rate is he has hemorrhagic shock. So given that he has hemorrhagic shock, he likely has some type of internal injury, whether it's to an organ, blood vessel, something like that. Um, we need imaging to find out. So that's what they do. Well, really, first they give him a bolus of IV fluids, which makes sense to help bring his blood pressure back up, and then they take him to the CT scanner, which actually shows a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And so this is a trauma patient. He has a retroperitoneal hemorrhage that's causing him to be anemic and have his blood pressure below and a tachycardic response. So the question is asking, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's condition? So which of the following is most likely to cause a retroperitoneal hemorrhage? So really what this is getting at is this is an anatomy question. It's looking at which of these is retroperitoneal and which of these is likely to cause retroperitoneal hemorrhage in a trauma situation. So we'll su summarize the key findings like we usually do. This is a young man presenting after a high-speed motor vehicle accident. He's tachycardic and in hypotensive shock. His physical exam is notable for abdominal tenderness. His labs are notable for anemia, hemoglobin of 5. And his CT reveals a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So to answer this question, you have to understand the peritoneum and intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. So intraperitoneal means that the organs are within the peritoneum. So what that means is, is we have the peritoneum itself is a double layer serous membrane. It's similar to the pleura, but a little more complicated. So you have the parietal layer, which we'll draw here in red. So you have the parietal layer here, which is in red. extends along here. We're just drawing it along the border. So you can see it kind of comes down and drapes over the bladder and then the uterus in females and the pelvis. It comes back around like this and comes all the way around. So that's the parietal layer. And then the visceral layer, which we'll draw in blue here. So the visceral layer is actually, you know, it, it surrounds the viscera. It's in the name. So it surrounds the organs. So it's going to come around and surround the liver like this. It comes down and surrounds the stomach like this, as you can see. Comes and surrounds 
the transverse colon. There's parts of the colon that are not intraperitoneal, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then you can see it comes down here and surrounds some of the small intestines as well. So you have intraperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. And so to really understand that, a retroperitoneal organ is it's in the name, retro, behind. So it's going to be posterior. So you can see these organs here, like the aorta, for example. This is the aorta. It's labeled here. It's retroperitoneal. It's behind the peritoneum. It just means it's not surrounded by the peritoneum versus the stomach, where the liver is intraperitoneal. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break from the case right now to let you know that Da Vinci Cases is brought to you by Da Vinci Academy which provides online video courses for the medical basic sciences. These courses are taught using a variety of teaching methods, including bullet point outlines, diagrams, radiology images, and chalk talks to explain the fundamental concepts. We then teach the application of those concepts to numerous clinical pearls that are frequently tested on medical school exams and the USMLE. Our video courses are available on our website, dviacademy.com, as monthly subscriptions starting at $9.99 per month. Each video course has a corresponding outline format textbook as well. You can find the link to our website in the description below. Also be sure to use the discount code DC20 to receive 20% off any of our video courses. Now back to the case. This is a axial section. The last one was a sagittal. And so you can see here's the stomach. It's surrounded by the peritoneum. The peritoneum, parietal peritoneum is shown in red here, as you can see as it comes around. Well, really, I, this whole entire, our previous diagram, I outlined it in red. In this diagram, you can see the entire peritoneum is red surrounding the stomach here. And you can see kidneys are retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneum. You can see the inferior vena cava, the aorta. These are all behind the peritoneum. If we come down lower. You can see part of the colon. Again, the ascending colon, descending colon. You can see part of the small intestine here is within the peritoneum. So the key here is you got to remember which ones are retroperitoneal. This is a very common anatomy test question. This is also very frequently tested on the USMLE um, as well. And it's also, you know, if you're doing a surgery rotation, if you're going into surgery, if you're doing radiology, uh, any type of specialty that you, where you need to know abdominal anatomy is really, really important to know this. So SAD pucker is kind of the acronym you can use or the mnemonic you can use to remember these. So S being suprarenal. So here's that cross section. You can see the left suprarenal is here. And remember the adrenal glands or the suprarenal glands, they sit on top of the kidneys, which are also retroperitoneal. And we'll get to that in a second. And so if you look here, you know, the stomach is kind of cut away in this diagram here. So here, here's the kidney here. Here's the right kidney. Here's the left kidney. And here's the adrenal gland or suprarenal glands. And you can see they're already tucked back here. Here's the diaphragm, the dome of the diaphragm. And you're, this is really all the way in the back here along the you know, posterior aspect or posterior abdominal wall, if you will. And then you can see the aorta and the IVC. And remember, these are running just anterior to the vertebral column. So this is all behind or retro peritoneal. Next, we have the aorta and the IVC. I already pointed this out a little bit in our original diagram, but here's the aorta here. Here it is coming down like this behind. Also, the main branches of the aorta too, especially like the renal arteries, for example, are retro peritoneal. The IVC, is also retroperitoneal. And so we can show this here as well. Here's the aorta in our transverse diagram or axial diaphragm and the IVC. These are both retroperitoneal. So you can, they're just on top of the, or just anterior to the vertebral bodies here. Same thing here, here's the aorta here if we go uh, further down. And then again, this is that diagram here, just giving you multiple views of this. Just, you know, the anatomy is so visual, it, we just have to give you, you know, all the different visuals, I think, to fully co uh, comprehend this. So you see here, this is, you know, posterior to all of these structures here. The duodenum, so you remember there's four part, four segments to the duodenum. So the first segment is actually intraperitoneal, but the second, third, and fourth segments are all retroperitoneal. And so if you remember, you know, if you have the stomach like this, Remember, it kind of you have the greater curvature, the lesser the esophagus kind of comes in like that. You have the fundus that comes up like this, you have the diaphragm like that. And so, if you remember, the stomach kind of comes down like this. So, the duodenum has this kind of first portion out here, and then it kind of makes that C shape, if you recall. So, that first segment 
is still in is still intraperitoneal. But then you get these second, third, and fourth segments. And we actually show you that here. So here you can see that it, as it's kind of traveling in this posterior aspect, you see, oh, wow, it's just right near the aorta and IVC, which are also retroperitoneal, just adjacent to the, near the kidneys here. They're also retroperitoneal. And so you can appreciate that as well. The pancreas, so the head, neck, and body are all retroperitoneal. Here we show this in the diagram. The exception is the tail. So the tail of the pancreas is, is not retroperitoneal. It's intraperitoneal. Again here, you see, you see this is kind of just a collection of all the retroperitoneal organs here. This is a really good diagram for this. You know, you see the pancreas here, the duodenum, the kidneys, and then the suprarenal glands as well. The ascending and descending colon, as you can see here and here, those are also, as we'll get to. Next, you have the ureters, which again, you know, the kidneys are just anterior to the vertebral column, and the ureters kind of run down and then join the bladder and the pelvis here. And so they essentially, you know, run retroperitoneal as well. Here's another great diagram. Here's where the ureters are coming off as well in the kidney here. And actually, if we go back to this diagram real quick, you can see the ureters as well here and here running retroperitoneal. The colon. So if you see in the diagram, this sagittal diagram here, here's a transverse colon. Transverse colon is intraperitoneal. See how it's surrounded by the peritoneum here? If we come here to this axial, you get a good view of this. You have the ascending colon here descending colon here and you can see they're traveling behind the peritoneum so those are retroperitoneal the kidneys again they are retroperitoneal as well again this is a great diagram kind of showing all of these different retroperitoneal organs again here they are shown again retroperitoneal kind of running with the descending ascending colon here the esophagus so the esophagus has a very short course in the abdomen but it is actually retroperitoneal and you can actually see it's fortunate it's cut away because the stomach is kind of cut away, but here, this is the esophagus here, just poking its head through the diaphragm, making that a uh, small course to the back, the posterior aspect of the stomach. And then lastly, the rectum. And then, so the rectum, I think this does a great job of showing it here. It's just posterior to the peritoneum. So if we come back to the question, which of the following is most likely to cause this patient's condition? Which of the following of these is retroperitoneal? And if there's more than one that's retroperitoneal, which one is the most likely to cause a retroperitoneal hemorrhage? So a perforated gallbladder, the gallbladder is just adjacent to the liver, it's intraperitoneal. The other thing is it theoretically could cause a hemorrhage, but it, usually the bigger problem with the gallbladder perforation is that you're going to have biliary sludge, you have infection and things like that, um, and people uh, can get sepsis. Liver laceration definitely could cause a huge hemorrhage. The liver is a very vascular organ, but the liver is intraperitoneal. It's not going to cause a retroperitoneal hemorrhage. The spleen is also intraperitoneal. Spleen rupture can also cause a pretty big hemorrhage, but it's, a, it's an intraperitoneal. Renal artery aneurysm, the renal artery coming just off the aorta is retroperitoneal. A ruptured renal an aneurysm definitely can result in a retroperitoneal hematoma and would definitely cause this hemorrhagic shock pretty fast. Now, in this scenario, whether the trauma caused it, sometimes these things are kind of unfortunately ticking time bombs, for lack of a better way of describing it. And sometimes just, you know, having some type of blunt trauma to the outside can cause these things to rupture. Uh, a spike in blood pressure can cause them to rupture. You know, all, you know, sometimes they just spontaneously, we don't really know, and they, and they cause. But these can actually be pretty, these can be very deadly if they're not dealt with. And typically, it's either open surgery or endovascular. Uh, you can actually coil these aneurysms, which is pretty cool. Lastly here, jejunal porphyration. The jejunum is intraperitoneal. Obviously, that causes its own bag of problems, but that is an intraperitoneal problem. So to summar summarize, this is a patient that would had a renal artery aneurysm, was in a high-speed motor vehicle accident that caused the aneurysm to rupture, resulting in a retroperitoneal hemorrhage, causing hemorrhagic shock. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the DaVinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every DaVinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The DaVinci Hour, where we interview attendings and residents across medicine to learn more about their experiences, their specialties, and to get their insights on navigating a career in medicine. You can find The DaVinci Hour podcast on our website or any platform where podcasts are found. Lastly, you can find all of our video courses and corresponding outline form books on our website. Don't forget to use the discount code DC20 for 20% off.